Okay, good morning everybody and uh, good morning also to whoever has patiently waited for this to uh, start out there in cyberspace. Um, my name is Ignacio Castuera. I'm uh, the director of the Latin America Project of the Center for Process Studies and more recently the the name has not completely been, or the title has not completely been decided upon, but my main responsibility is to do whatever it is that John Cobb asks me to do in preparation for the 2015 conference, which is the 10th International Whitehead Conference, a monumental uh, event that will cap the, uh, the life and contributions of uh, of John Cobb. I'm not saying that he will not be living after that. He comes from a family that has lived way up into their 90s. And also the process philosophy, process theology family is uh, has a record for longevity. And so uh, if, if those of you out there who are into analytical philosophy or whatever it is that you just think about your lives and you know how, how much longer you want to live. Hearts are lived to be over 100. And uh, I actually was at his 100th birthday. He lectured in German at the age of 96 in Germany. So uh, we, we are, we, that's, I think we have something in there with the spirit of the universe that allows the process people to live a lot longer. Uh, so John will continue to live after this event. I am convinced of that. But the event on 2015 is going to be the capping stone of his career and I will do anything he asks me to do. Now, that has not been translated into an actual title. Right now, we came up with Director of Special Projects or something like that, so, but essentially, I'll do anything uh, that Cobb asks me to do to make sure that this conference in 2015, June 4th through 7th, 2015, in Claremont, California, that that is a successful event. Um, we have a section, actually now two sections, but it started out as a section to deal with religions. But we know the problem with the word religions, because especially in the last 30 years in the United States, the, the religious right has given a horrible name to religion. And even though the historic and the etymological meaning of the word religion is not problematic, it's that which binds things together. You know, the, we all have ligaments and so the red ligare is a wonderful term, but unfortunately you have, a, you have to re accept the fact that, that it has been polluted, it has been contaminated. And so we, we were looking for an alternative way of talking about that. And John so far has come up with the idea of the axial ways, meaning the time when the great religious and philosophical ideas of the world emerged about 2,500 years ago. Uh, that's when Buddhism got started, when the best uh, thinking in Hinduism came up. That's about the time when the uh, philosophers in, in, um, in, in Greece came up. And interestingly enough, also that was the time of the prophetic movement in Israel. So um, axial age is a wonderful uh, term. Carl Jaspers gave us that. Um, but um, some people out in the common world go, uh-huh, you, you know, they, they, they don't know what, and especially since it also sounds like axis, you know, so is this the axis of good versus the axis of evil? But we, you know, anyway, so we're still thinking about a way of making sure that people do understand that we're talking about the spiritual uh, traditions of the world and uh, the, the ways of connecting with the higher values. Even atheists, we want to welcome atheists that are thinking correctly and want to do the right thing. So that original section now is divided into two sections, one with the essentially the people of the book. And I begged John to look for somebody else to lead that one because I wanted to be connected with the indigenous wisdom, the indigenous paths. And so, um, I had already by that time con contacted uh, Chris Daniels, and Chris will be heading that specific sec um, track. So each section has a number of tracks, and Chris Daniels, who will speak in a few minutes, uh, is the person who will be heading that track. He is the person who has put together a, 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 a PhD dissertation where he, I will not tell you too much other than he looks deeply into both the indigenous traditions, at least of the Pacific Northwest, but also some beyond, and then also how those uh, ideas uh, 
uh, link or connect or do not with uh, Whiteheadian principles. So that's the way we started out, and we sent out, you know, uh, uh, our lures, we say in <laughs> in uh, in process thought, all over the place, and we got some tentative yeses and then ten definite noes, and then some of the noes became yeses and all that. And then, unbeknownst to us, there was a, another uh, uh, conference that was being planned here in Claremont. We usually connect with each other very well about this, but this time, for some reason, we did not know until only, I, at least I did not know until I got a phone call from, from um, Andrew saying, uh, do you know anything about Serene Jones? Is Serene Jones coming to the conference on, on uh on the indigenous values, Serene Jones is the president of Union Theological Seminary. I said, no. Uh, then we discovered that Serene Jones was speaking at another conference on hope, highlighted by the founder of the Theology of Hope, Jorgen Moltmann. So here we are. So we started reinventing ourselves on the way, which I'm okay with. <laughs> and uh, I like what we have come up with. We had already connected with Maulana Karenga, who's going to speak in a few minutes. Um, but let me tell you why specifically I feel that Maulana is uh, very important. But let me start, let me go back one more step. Um, Friday night, yes, last night, we uh, had the, the real opening of this event with the, with the uh, film, The Return of Navajo Boy. And John, I want you to just come over so that people at least get to see who you are. But uh, this is a, a, a wonderful story uh, in more ways than one that I think also will help illustrate some of the ways in which I think if we remain open as indigenous peoples and regularly are, uh, normally are, um, that uh, if we remain open, then the gaps are filled in, in a beautiful way. Um, John Wayne Cly is the main subject of the film uh, which is entitled The Return of Navajo Boy. And I think we still have some um, DVDs that, that some of the folks here can. Oh, yeah. And those of you in, in the cyber world, you could just go to The Return of Navajo Boy and you will uh, then um, uh, be able to, to uh, get what you are not getting now. You can just get it uh, directly from, from uh, Jeff Spitz. Thank you. So uh, Jeff Spitz was a gift to me and it was a gift from beyond the grave. I, um, and, and I, one of these days I told John I want to write about the Whiteheadian issues of objective and mortality and you know how people who are quote dead are still very much alive and influencing us very, very much. But I, I wanna say this and with that then I'll hand it over to, I'll pass it over to Maulana. Um, I served for five years in Watts at an African-American church, the best five years of my ministry. Uh, it was a church that was founded by Latinos, by Mexican-Americans specifically, and it was built under the ministry of a pastor that was about this tall, I still got to meet him, and he was one of Villas, Pancho Villas Dorados, which was the elite, the elite um, fighters of, of the Mexican Revolution uh, on the side of Villa. And there's still a plaque there at St. John's United Methodist Church directly across from uh, the Watts Towers. So when the bishop told me that I was going to be moved from Pacific Palisades, the wealthiest church in the Methodist <coughs> Conference here, to the, quote, poorest church in the district, I jumped up and down with great joy. <laughs> <laughs> because what I learned and what I got in those five years surpassed everything that I had uh, hap that had happened in my ministry, and um, and my ministry has been very interesting and very rich in many ways. But those five years at once were great. The woman who was playing the organ faithfully every Sunday at once, her name is Geneva Day. Geneva Day had. Twins, one of the twins died tragically from the same illness that killed the Muppets, Jim Hansen. And I did the memorial and funeral for her. And unbeknownst to me, at the end of all that very difficult and tragic event in her life, she said to the rest of the family, when my time comes, I want Ignacio to do my funeral. So uh, earlier in the, well, uh, towards the end of last year, I got a call that Geneva was very ill. I went to visit her, on and on. 
it did happen. She did die. I went and did the, the both the interment and the funeral. And in the uh, repast, which is so common in the African American um, uh, funerals, there was a man, white, bald headed. What is this man doing here? So I go and I sit next to him. What are you doing here? <laughs> My name is Jeff Spitz, he says. And how do you connect with, with Geneva? Well, Geneva Day wanted the best education for her children. The Los Angeles uh, uh, educational system at that time said, oh, you can go to any school you want to. We cannot provide transportation, but you can, you can do that. So she got in her car and she drove her children to three different schools throughout their whole schooling in Los Angeles. And the, two, the oldest daughter went to Beverly Hills. And that's where Jeff Spitz was in school. Jeff's family was splitting. His world was crumbling. But there was something that was a constant in his life. A black woman dropping a black girl in the morning and picking her up in the afternoon every day. And so he befriended that family. And then went to the, to the ghetto. <laughs> and he was one of those white guys that, what is he doing around here? And eventually, he really did belong because they, the Day family provided the credentials. Fast forward, Jeff Spitz is the producer of The Return of Navajo Boy. And on Tuesday in Chicago, the... Uh, uh, film Food Patriots is going to be premiered. And Food Patriots, I, again, I, uh, those of you in cyberspace, please uh, connect with foodpatriots.com. Um, Spitz is also now expanding, extending his concern now not only to what has happened to Navajos in the reservation, but he saw through the threat to the Navajos in the reservation, the threat to the whole earth. And now he, uh, he's encouraging people to do uh, gardening in their homes and all of that. And Food Patriots is about that. <clears throat> so Geneva Day, you're here with us today. And um, I think that that's a value that indigenous peoples have. That is, we value our ancestors and our friends who have gone. And if it had not been for Geneva, <clears throat> and if it hadn't been for, uh, for some foolish divinely foolish bishop that sent me to Watts, this conference might not be happening. And so I'm, I'm very, very uh, happy to welcome you all here. Normally we uh, introduce ourselves uh, and we go around. We might have to do that after, after or just before the, um, the uh, uh, Tongva canoe arrives. But right now I'm, I want uh, Professor Maulana Karenga, whom I knew before as Ron, <clears throat> to uh, then come over and talk about an extremely important issue. How do we, A, connect with our ancient traditions, and how do we make them alive again? So the reviver, the creator, the, re the reigniter of Kwanzaa, Ron Maulana. I don't say that. Na <laughs> Why would you call me out of my name? No more, no more. Cassius, Maulana. Cassius Clay. Maulana. <laughs> I, I should respect that because I keep on telling my old friends, call me Ignacio, not Nacho anymore. You know, <laughs> they used to call okay. me Nacho. Maulana, you move would you please there. move over here. Yeah, that'd be a lot easier, yeah. Uh, I don't want to take any more of his time, but, you know, I think that he, Maulana, really is uh, the uh, man for the hour. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good. I want to say thanks to Ignacio for the invitation to come and share with you some thoughts on cultural recovery, Sankofa, Sarujta, preparing and remaking ourselves in the world. Just as a matter of introduction, uh, so that you would know my work and also know that uh, I have some common ground with what you're doing and the kind of philosophical foundation framework in which you work. Um, I'm professor chair of the Department of African Studies. Within that, my fields in which I have my terminal degrees are political science, uh, first PhD, and then my second one is in religion and social ethics. And my dissertation 
uh, was called Mat, the moral idea in ancient Egypt, a study in classical African ethics. <clears throat> and one of the things that I wanted to uh, do was to retrieve uh, and uh, reconstruct uh, the best of African thought uh, and to use it and pose it as a philosophical option for engaging the issues of our time. And certainly the question of how we treat the earth, the question of the health, the wholeness, and well-being of the earth is central to that. And I was thinking as I was driving over here about the whole idea of the distinction the white Hedians make between being and becoming. We make the same in ancient Egyptian tradition of Mat. Uh, in the beginning of the Husea, the sacred text of ancient Egypt, which I've translated and, and made um, available, uh, Ra, God says, when I came into being, being itself came into being. All being came into being after I came into being, which is a testament to becoming. The creation narrative says that in the beginning, actually before the beginning, Ra existed but had not yet become. You see? Mm -hmm. And they used two words, wenut, which means to exist, and keper, which means to become. And so he is the Lord of becomings, and he is constantly becoming. And we, in emulation, called uh, iret mi ra, or in Latin, imitati, tato dei, we are constantly becoming, and we're constantly co creating ourselves and the world. So I understand uh, these things, and of course, I just want to let you know that I find common ground with you, both in terms of my um, uh, PhD work and my teaching. I teach uh, religion, I teach ancient Egyptian ethical thought, I teach other courses related. So what I want to do, uh, however, is in offering my contribution to this vital and truly urgent conversation is to lay out a philosophical framework and and foundation for my intellectual and practical work uh, of culture recovery and culture reconstruction, and then move to discuss perhaps the signature piece of my culture recovery and work uh, called Kwanzaa. I want to talk about its relevance uh, not only to the process of culture recovery and reconstruction, but also about the African ethical imperative of Sarud Stop, that is, to heal, repair, and remake the world making it more beautiful and beneficial than we inherited. And certainly in the process of how we see things, we must question the human, begin by questioning the human sense of arrogance that led to the self-assigning of humans in the name of God, gun, and questionable good of man, the right to dominate, to tread down, and relentlessly, relentlessly exploit the world, earth. And we must ask ourselves in earnest, what real or hidden reasons, what latent logic or simple self-serving uh, common sense is there in knowingly destroying the basis for life on the planet, including our own and that of future generations? In a word, what is the nature need of vulgar materialism, social madness, and moral numbness that allows us to practice ecocide mm. without considering, mm. caring about, or taking serious it's sure in certain implications for world genocide. As Africans, we are compelled uh, to practice a morality of remembrance and recovery. <coughs> as late as in our time, when the great civil rights and human rights activists of our time, Fannie Lou Hamer, said, there are two things we should all care about, never to forget where we came from, and always praise the bridges that carried us over. And in that, she teaches us a morality of remembrance. And part of our recovery is to practice that morality of remembrance, to retrieve the best of what it means to be African and human, and speak that special culture truth to the world, and use it to make our own unique contribution to the forward flow of human history. And so we, in practice, in the morality of remembrance and recovery, reach back and dig deep in order to recover from our culture, ancient and modern, the best of what it means to be African and human, and to bring it forth in the service of doing and sustaining good in and for the world. 
And another one of our texts, the Odu Ifam, it says that, let's do things with joy, for surely humans have been divinely chosen to bring good into the world, and that this is the fundamental mission and meaning of human life. And so this doctrine here, that we all are chosen, and we're chosen, not all humans are chosen, not over and against anyone, but chosen with everyone to do one thing, to bring good into the world and not let any good be lost. And to remind us of it, the word in Yoruba for human being and chosen one is, is the same. And that's Aniyan, chosen to bring good into the world. This vision, of course, is a process and practice we call in the Akan language, uh, Sankofa, which means to reach back and retrieve it and bring it forth to enrich and expand our lives and to construct the good world we all want and deserve to live in. Here we engage in a kind of intellectual and cultural archaeology, digging deep within our history and culture to identify, recover, and rec reconstruct in meaningful and useful way, pathways and possibilities to a new way of being and relating as humans in the world. My work is done within the framework of my philosophy called Kawita, which I define as an ongoing synthesis of the best of African thought and practice in constant exchange with the world. So this conversation I'm having with you represents a process in which I engage the best of human thinking and at the same time bring forth my own idea. Because in this process, there is a verse from the Husea that says, it is wrong to walk upside down in darkness. Therefore, I would bring forth uh, this day the truth that is within me, for surely there's a truth within me. And so the truth of our culture is a constant quest to struggle to extract things of meaning and value and to use them to enrich and expand our lives. I... Um, <clears throat> started to uh, develop uh, the whole idea of recovery. And when I was a um, student at uh, City College uh, in the late uh, 50s, uh, 59, uh, and then in the UCLA in the 60s. And this vision that I had and began to develop ha has as a core values that reaffirm the oneness of being, the interrelatedness of life, and the cooperative responsibility to build the good and sustainable world we all want and deserve to live in. And as a result of my study, I mean, this concept now is rooted in the principle and practice of what we call Ma'at, or Ma'at, M-A-A-T, ancient Egyptian um, uh, polysemic word, multiple meaning word that serves as a moral idea in ancient e Egypt. And it means and requires rightness in three realms, in the realm of the divine, in the realm of the um, nature, and in the realm uh, of society or among human beings. It links the divine, natural, and social in an indispensable, pardon me, in an inseparable bond and sees the world, the whole world, as sacred space. Moreover, it recognizes the world is often damaged in natural and social ways and urges that we constantly practice Saru's ta, a pillar of Majin ethics, which means as I said earlier, to repair, renew, remake, and transform the world, making it more beautiful and beneficial than we inherited. But we also retrieve from modern texts. I don't want you to think we stay in the ancient. We also, in, in dealing with this whole idea of recovery and using it to enrich our lives and to transform, repair, and remake the world, we, we also draw from Sankofa models and messages for environmental ethic from more recent time and learn valuable lessons from them. Clearly the gentle and creative scientist, Dr. George Washington Carver, easily comes to mind. He not only made miracles out of peanuts, corn, and soy, but also strengthened the poor, uh, uh, subsistence farmers, and helped transform and save Southern agriculture. He had come to Tuskegee, he said, for the benefit of my people. And joining the faculty at the university, he not only taught various courses, but also linked campus and community, reaching out to small farmers, 
writing bulletins of suggestions, lecturing and conducting experiment with them and for their benefit. His environmental vision began with a profound appreciation, even reverence for the natural world. In this regard, he taught kindness toward nature. I mean, this is a very beautiful concept, a kindness toward nature. It's expressed in his teachings that we should even be kind to, quote, be kind to soil. I mean, for, he says, quote, unkindness to anything is an injustice to that thing. And there are consequences for this injustice, Dr. Carver also taught, the, or, the organic unity of the world. He stressed the, quote, the mutual relationships of the animal, mineral, and vegetable kingdom, and how utterly impossible it is for one to exist in a highly organized state without the others, unquote. Moreover, he anticipated our later discussion of environmental racism, recognizing the intersection of race, poverty, and land use and ownership and the greater inability of the poor to deal with radical changes in climate, soil, and social conditions. Dr. Carver also was self-consciously a conservative, practicing the three R's of environmentalism, reduce, reuse, and recycle. Indeed, he said, quote, my work is that of conservation. As a rule, we are wasteful, he said. But if people became aware of the interrelatedness of things and were ecologically conscious, they would, quote, they could not help but recognize ways to make use of materials they had previously discarded or overlooked." Unquote. Finally, he taught not only the complexity and interrelatedness of nature, but also its fragility. And he stressed long-term solutions rather than quick fixes which aggravate a problem and delay urgent attention which should be given. To sustain the world, we, might be rightfully we must be rightfully attentive to, to it, he said. Thus he said, quote, look about you. Take hold of things that are here, unquote. Be kind to the world and all in it. Detest the waste, he said. Cooperate to create good and to share it equitably and wisely. But at the heart of any sound and effective environmental vision and practice must also be active engagement to change and end the social condition and not only threaten and diminish the environment, but also devastate and destroy the people themselves. In a word, social justice is the foundation and fulcrum on which environmental justice is raised or founded. If we don't have social justice, it's very difficult to talk about environmental justice. Yeah, yeah. This is why Dr. Wangadi Matai, environmental activist, Nobel Peace Prize laureate, and founder of the Green Belt Movement, which over 30 years planted 30 million trees in Kenya, links democracy, human rights, sustainable development and peace. It is why she linked poverty, oppression, and environmental degradation. She thus sought to empower the people through inclusion and effective participation in building the world they want and deserve. Indeed, she says that through work and struggle, quote, they come to recognize that they are the primary custodian and beneficiaries of the environment that sustains them, unquote. And they move to protect themselves and the environment from, quote, the threat of globalization, commercialization, privatization, and piracy of biological materials found in their lands." Unquote. Dr. Matai also calls for an African culture revival that reaffirms our ancient and ongoing reverence for nature and our sense of oneness with the world that, quote, revives our sense of belonging to a larger family with which we have shared our evolutionary process. Unquote. Our task, she concludes, in the spirit and speech of Saruj Tai, is to, quote, assist the earth to heal her wounds and in the process, heal our own. Indeed, to embrace the whole creation in all its diversity, beauty, and wonder, unquote. Yeah, yeah. This concept helps us to evolve in Kawita philosophy, the concept that we are injured physicians, <clears throat> injured physicians who must, in the process of healing ourselves, heal and remake the world. So that is always an interactive process. And the reason we say injured physician rather than just injured person, because we don't want the uh, people to not realize the great potential within them, that they have it within their capacity to actually heal themselves so they must become physicians 
that not only heal and repair and remake themselves in the process, also heal, repair, and remake the world. This moral mandate of Sarush Ta is found in the ancient Egyptian sacred text of Usia, which teaches us to see and sense the world as sacred space, as a shared heritage given by the divine, respected and constantly renewed by the ancestors and left to us as a rich legacy to cherish, care for, and continue to renew, and then pass on to generations afterwards to do likewise. Indeed, Saruj Tai is a constant call, an ongoing obligation to actively care for the health, wholeness, and sustainment of the world, to constantly raise up that which is in ruin, to repair that which is damaged, <clears throat> to rejoin that which is severed, to replenish that which is depleted, to strengthen that which is weakened, to set right that which is wrong, and to make firm and make flourish that which is fragile and undeveloped. Mm -hmm. And so Dr. Matai tells us, quote, we are called to assist the earth, again, to heal her wounds and in the process to heal our own. This stress on agency possibility, and possibility reaffirms the Kawaita contention Again, that we are injured physicians who must heal and repair ourselves in the process and practice of healing and repairing the world. And this requires our returning to the upward and enlightening paths of our ancestors. She calls it, and the Africans in Kenya who are uh, in her uh, movement call it facing Mount Kenya, really my Kirinyaga, the place of brightness, which looms like a giant lighthouse high above the horizon of history pointing toward new possibility for human flourishing and the well-being of the world. If we do, as we say in Kawaita, walk gently, act justly, and relate rightfully in and for the world. It is in that context that I created Kwanzaa in the midst of the black freedom movement. And when I say the black freedom movement, I'm talking about the civil rights phase, which is 1955 to 1965, and the black power freight, which is 1965 to 75. Often when people talk about the civil rights movement, pardon me, often when they talk about the black freedom movement, they always say just the civil rights movement. Well, what that does is that rewrites history, and it takes it out of the fundamental focus and foundation in which it is in the struggles of black people to expand the realm of freedom in this country and to pose a new way of being American and human in the world. And it just leaves it out there as just a normal kind of thing that meant adjustment of an established order. Mm -hmm. Actually, there was a lot of blood. There was a lot of things that happened, a lot of upturning. And so in the midst of this, I'm at UCLA. And the question becomes, what are we going to do about the movement? The movement is emerging. It's very active. <laughs> and so some of us left school. And when we left school, the question facing us was the one that Mary McLeod asked. She said, knowledge is the prime need of the hour, but we would need to know what are you going to do with your knowledge? And she said to us, it is up to us who know to discover the dawn and then share it with the masses that need it most. And so the question is, how do I take my knowledge of African culture? Because I had already gone through a process where I had re-Africanized myself. And that's why I make a point of, you know, like, who am I, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and uh, how do I call myself? Mm -hmm. So I created the principle, and when the second principle, Kuji Chagalia, and it says what? To define ourselves, to name ourselves, mm -hmm. to create for ourselves, to speak for ourselves. It's amazing that we started with to define ourselves. Mm -hmm. What do you think we start with our define? The same re reason women start with definition. The same reason all oppressed people start with definition. Because one of the greatest powers in the world is the power to define reality yeah. and make others accept it even when it's to their disadvantage. Mm -hmm. So the first act of a free people is to define itself even before it strikes the first physical blow. It must define itself. It must create space where it can speak to itself and understand itself in new ways. Because how you understand yourself dictates how you, in fact, assert yourself in the world. And so the celebration of Kwanzaa 
is a significant marker, not only because of what it says about expansive message and enduring meaning. The, the, the expansive me message and enduring meaning that Kwanzaa has for millions throughout the world African community, but because of what it says about us as an African people. For it speaks to our profound commitment to self-determination, to cultural reaffirmation, and to the celebration of ourselves. It speaks to our right and responsibility to speak our own special cultural truth in a multicultural world and to practice and promote Kwanzaa's core principle, Nguzo Saba, the seventh principle, the hub and hinge on which the holiday turned. As always, every season and celebration of Kwanzaa rightfully calls to mind its origin in the ancient African first fruit harvest celebration and the model of the harvest which stresses the cooperative creation, gathering and sharing of good, specifically food as a life staining good, but also it teaches us gratitude for the bountifulness and beauty of the world and our commitment to protect and preserve the earth as both a source of life and a site of the sacred. I repeat, as both a source of life and a site of the sacred. This, our Kwanzaa always comes then with increased concern for the well-being of the world because of the continuing injustice and oppression imposed on humans and the injury and injustice inflicted on the earth. As Dr. Matai said, today we are faced, I quote, today we are faced with a challenge that calls for a shift in our thinking, a shift that stops us from destroying the very basis of human life on the planet and causes us to assist the earth again, to heal her wound, and in the process, heal ourselves. It is here that we link the concept and practice of sharing the world with that of sustaining the world. For the well-being and flourishing of humans are tied to the health and wholeness of the world. Therefore, our ancestors and us, therefore, for our ancestors and for us, sustainment is a dual concept of both well-being and right being. I repeat, mm -hmm. sustainment is a dual concept of both well-being and right being of and in the world, a world of social and environmental justice, peace, physical and spiritual well-being, and ongoing development. And here the Nguzo Saba are again posed as a vital and valuable way to walk, work, and struggle in the world for the well-being, wholeness, and flourishing of ourselves in the world. And their central and summary message is walk gently, act justly, and relate, relate rightly in and for the world. Now, one of the things I wanted, I had said that in, uh, I'm trying to go to the fest because I want to end up about now, is that I, um, I created Kwanzaa in this context of the struggle uh, for three basic reasons. One, to reaffirm our rootedness in African culture and to extract from that culture new and more ethical and reverent ways of being African and human in the world. So we had to reaffirm that rootedness in our culture and recover the best of what it spoke to us and the world because we had been lifted out of our culture by the Holocaust of enslavement and made a footnote and forgotten casualty in other people's culture. <clears throat> and so as Cabral says, Part of our struggle was what? To return to our own history and culture. So as we always say, we could speak our own special culture truth and make our own unique contribution to how the society and world are reconceived and reconstructed. Second, I created Kwanzaa in order to give us a time when we as African people could come together, reaffirm the bonds between us, and meditate on the awesome meaning of being African in the world. What does it mean to be the elders of humanity, mm. to be the fathers and mothers of humanity and mm. human civilization, mm. to have introduced in the Nile Valley some of the basic disciplines of human knowledge? What does it mean to be sons and daughters of the Holocaust of enslavement, to have demonstrated an adaptive vitality and a human resilience and resourcefulness unsurpassed by any people. Mm -hmm. What does it mean to hold on to your humanity in the most inhuman situation yeah. when you are simply an object of lust, sex, work, an instrument for someone else's will? 
What does it mean to come out of that? Having been, having your capacity to read and write outlawed, mm. and then coming out and in less than a hundred years, create a world-class li literature second to none. Mm. So we talk about Africa in ways, and African people in ways we don't do any other time all over the world, on every continent in the world, throughout the world African community, Kwanzaa is celebrated mm -hmm. by millions of people. And when they celebrate it, it's the Africanness that celebrate, so that it doesn't matter what religion you are, a class or political persuasion. The idea is that we are African people. And here at this moment, this week, this seven days, we reaffirm the dignity affirming and life enhancing values and history of our people yeah, yeah. and our culture. So that's important to me. Now, one of the things that I think uh, we, we, we need to do is ask ourselves, what does, what does Kwanzaa, oh, in the third reason, I'm sorry, I, I, I'm, I'm skipping over something to be left. The third reason I created Kwanzaa is to introduce and reaffirm the importance of communitarian African values, values that stress and strengthen family, community, and culture. And in fact, that's what Kwanzaa is, a celebration of family, community, and culture. And of course, the hub and hinge on which the holiday turns or the communitarian values we call the Nguzo Saba, or in English, the seven principles. We must, in fact, um, learn how to share the world and the responsibility for its care. And Kwanzaa becomes a time when we stress that. There are five fundamental uh, activities that we engage in at Kwanzaa overarching. The first is the ingathering of the people to reaffirm the bonds between them all over the world. Second, it is to a special time for uh, special reference for creator and creation. Time to give praise for the bountifulness of the earth and to recommit ourselves to protect and preserve it. Third, it's time to commemorate the past, to raise and praise the names of our ancestors, to extract the models of human excellence that they pose for us and to integrate them into our lives. And then uh, fourth, it is time to reaffirm our highest culture values, values that teach us to speak truth, to speak and seek truth, to do and demand justice, to honor our elders and our ancestors, to cherish and challenge our children, to care for the poor and vulnerable among us, to give food to the hungry, water to the thirsty, clothes to the naked, and a boat to those without one, to be a father for the orphan, a mother for the timid, a husband for the widow, a raft for the drowning, and a ladder for those trapped in the pit of despair. These are tech from the Hosea. So we teach that. Those are values that we teach. And we say that those are important. And in addition to that, we not only teach that, but we teach having a rightful relationship with the environment, OK? To constantly struggle against evil and injustice, and always to raise up and praise the good. So a lot of times when you see Kwanzaa on television, you just see dancing. Because they're not used to talking philosophy to black people. You know? <laughs> Can y'all dance? Give us a dance. What, what do y'all eat? They might ask, you see? But they won't <laughs> discuss the philosophy because, well, you know, they're not used to that. You know, like, they, you know, do you think? Do, do you think deep? You know? There's a word in ancient Egyptian called jayel, which means deep thinking. You know, and that's another thing that we teach. I mean, I teach it uh, all the time, but in Kawita, it, it is an expression of that. And deep, the jayel is interesting because. It has its etymology in medical terms, and it's a medical term that means to probe. It, it, it implies probing, okay, uh, uh, in, in, in for discovery, diagnosis, prognosis, and prescription, so that our philosophies, our conversation seeks to do this giant, this kind of deep uh, thinking. <clears throat> Let me just conclude by saying some of the um, things about the seven principles, which I think. The core message and expansive meaning of Kwanzaa is rooted in its role as a rightful and joyous celebration of family, community, and culture. Indeed, it is a celebration of a people in the rich and complex course of their daily life and in the midst of their awesome 
and transformative movement through human history. It is a holiday that grew out of the ancient origin of first fruit harvest celebrations, as I said, which celebrate the abundant good life and all living things and the good of the earth and all in it. It celebrates star and stone, rock and river, field and forest, and all the humans and animals and living beings in it. It rises also out of the modern struggle for an inclusive freedom, a substantive justice, a dignity affirming equality, and a life enhancing power of our people over their destiny and daily lives. And it bears the mark and message of both models and movements. It is this ancient, fertile, and constantly cultivated soil and source of our culture that explains the extraordinary and constant growth of Kwanzaa throughout the world African community. Surely Kwanzaa would not have lasted if it had simply been a seasonal trend or consumerist fad or the purchase of a product of a corporate cultivated consciousness. Moreover, its resilience and relevance, like its origin and future, do not lie in official approval, presidential greetings, or governmental recognition and endorsement by resolution on any level. Rather, Kwanzaa was conceived and created and introduced to the African community as an audacious act of self-determination, a culture creation that is rooted in and rose out of the wish and will of a people who saw its message, saw its message deep in meaning, world encompassing and reach and highly relevant in addressing the critical issues of our time and the practice of its principles as a valuable way to ground, guide, and enrich their lives. The Nguzo Saba, the seven principles, which are the hub and hinge on which the holiday turns, offers a foundation and framework to address issues of our time through both the principles and practices, a unity which cannot be broken without damaging and diminishing both principle and practice. This means prefiguring in our lives and practices the good world we all want and deserve to live in. And it requires constant reflection on and practicing these seven principles and the interrelated values directed toward bringing and sustaining good in the world. Surely in a world ravaged and ruined by war and defined by the division, oppression, and varied forms of greed, hatred, and hostility, the first principle, which is umoja, unity, invites an alternative sense of solidarity, a peaceful togetherness as families, communities, and fellow human beings. This principle of unity teaches us the oneness of our people everywhere, the common ground of our humanity with others, and our shared status as possessors of dignity and divinity, which we first taught in the Nile Valley as early as 2140 BCE. But this principle also encourages us to feel at one with and in the world, to be constantly concerned about its health and wholeness, especially as we face the possibilities or already presence of climate change and other disasters around the world. The second principle is Kujichagalil, self-determination, in a time in which occupation and oppression of countries and peoples are immorally presented as necessary and even salvation of the principle of Kuchajakalia self-determination rejects this and reaffirms the right of persons and people to determine their own destiny and daily life, to live in peace and security, and to flourish in freedom everywhere. In opposition to alienation and isolation from others, fostered fear and hatred for political purpose and a vulgar individualism at the expense of others, the principle, third principle, Ujima, collective working responsibility, teaches us the necessary and compelling commitment to work together to achieve and build a good community, society, and world we want and deserve to live in. And this means cooperatively repairing and renewing the world. The fourth principle is Ujima, cooperative economic. In a world where greed, resource, seizure, and plunder have been globalized with maximum technological and military power, we must uphold the principle and practice of Ujamaa, cooperative economic, shared work and shared wealth. This principle reaffirms the right to control and benefit from the resources of one's own land and one's own work, and to have an equitable and just share of the goods of the world. The fifth principle is Nia, in a world where there is urgent need to move beyond petty and perverse purposes and narrow and narcissistic concern. The 
principle and practice of Nia purpose provides us with an expansive ethical alternative for it teaches us the collective vocation of bringing, increasing, and sustaining good in the world and ensuring the well-being, health, and wholeness of the world. The next principle is Kumba. Sixth principle, Kumba creativity. In a world where war lays waste the land and lives of people, where depletion, pollution, and plunder of the environment put the world at risk and climate change threaten devastating and brings, threatens and brings devastating hurricanes, flood and famine, million more of refugees, and the submersion by rising seas of whole communities and nations. The principle and practice of Columba creativity is appeared in. For it puts forth the ethical ancestry teaching from the Husea of Saru's Ta, the moral obligation, as I said, to do all we can in the way we can to heal, repair, rebuild, and renew the world, leaving it more beautiful and beneficial than we inherited. Finally, the last principle is faith. I always say, I did the seven principles, Umoja, unity, Kujichaglia, self-determination, Ujima, collective work and responsibility, Ujimai, cooperative economic, Nia, purpose, Kumba, creativity, and Imani, faith. I put Umoja at the beginning because without unity, nothing is possible. Friendship, marriage, house, family, <clears throat> just brotherhood, just nothing. But without faith, we can't sustain it. Faith is a foundation on which we stand. Here we stand on this faith. And so finally, in a world and time when words of hope and change evaporate into business as usual, when peace is postponed for war and social programs put on hold, and bankers bailed out in the poor erased from the agenda. Imani faith offers us a shield against despair, cynicism, and paralyzing disappointment. Faith calls on us to believe in the good we seek to create, to work for that good, and to live it in our daily lives. Indeed, only in this way can we be able to repair and renew ourselves, and in the process and practice, repair, rebuild, and renew the world. In the spirit of the steadfast faith of our ancestors, let us then meditate on and give ever deeper meaning in actual practice to all we wish and want for the world. And in the prayer for requests of our ancestors, may we speak and seek truth and do and demand justice everywhere. May we always evaluate rightfully, not act in disregard for the sacred and for the people. May we enter praise and leave loved everywhere we go. May our speech be wholesome and without blame and injury to others. May we reject evil and embrace joy. May we live a lifetime of peace. Whereas the ancestors said, exceedingly good is the practice of peace. And there is no blame for those who practice it. And may we pass in peace, having done much and brought good in the world. And finally, may we always remember this fundamental teaching of our ancestors. It is both a question and an answer. And the question is, what is our duty? And it is to know our past and honor it, to engage our present and improve it, and to imagine a whole new future and to forge it in the most ethical, effective, and expansive ways. Thank you. Well, I have the, I have the joyful duty of kicking off some responses and question time. Um, Ignacio asked for maybe 15 or 20 minutes of this. Good. So, Professor, I will uh, try to come up with a good, good. response. I'm not sure. Um, I'll just sit down. So um, as a white woman, obviously I don't have the same cultural experience as you do, but I, I am really touched and moved by your notion of cultural recovery um, because I guess I would call it somewhat of a, a sense of ontological colonization that mm -hmm. I have had my entire life, and unfortunately that was in response to Christianity. 
Um, so I've had to do the same sort of process, mm -hmm. uh, looking back to mm -hmm. whatever cultural roots I have, both Native American and you know Celtic and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So um, I I really like that the manner in which you're presenting this process is applicable to all different peoples. Mm -hmm. This is not just an African experience, and I would like to to know. Um, if you've had this kind of response from other people, from other cultures. In right. The past. Now, it's very good. And we, we can do it. Thank you so much for that. And I appreciate that. Now, I'm, I, you can tell I'm into language, right? So I'm always concerned about how people <laughs> phrase things. So you say your name. Margaret. Stout. Margaret. Margaret said, this is not just an African thing. It applies to all. Well, it's better to say this is not only this, this, this is a beautiful African thing, but I notice it also speaks to the best of what it means to be human also. And what I want to say about that is that I don't want us to ever think that African doesn't speak at the same time to humanity. The best of African culture, in my understanding, is the best of human culture. And I say the same thing about other people's culture, right? The best of our culture, speaks to the best of what it means to be human. That's why we call it best. If it's not that, then we don't <laughs> need to call it that. So every, me every message of substance has two aspects to it, a particular and a universal. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm looking at her, but I'm gonna start joking. Every message of substance has two aspects. It has both a particular and a universal. Mm -hmm. For example, the Abrahamic traditions, which are, uh, you know, are rooted in, I, I assume, they are in a certain social historical context. The language, the imagery of sheep, the imagery of herders, and the images of sand and hell and fire and all that, that's particular. I mean, it wouldn't appeal to an Inuit in the same way. Rescue me if I'm wrong. I mean, it's not like they would want fire. You know what I'm saying? So, so, it, but, because it speaks, these Abrahamic traditions, because they have within them certain things that speak to the best of what it means to be human, then other people who didn't create this tradition actually can borrow from, build on, and create their own tradition within it. Do you all see what I'm saying? So I want you to see the African philosophy. Kawhid is my philosophy. This is what I was talking about or any other African philosophy as saying that it's gonna have a particular aspect to it. I mean, when you, when you talk about uh, these traditions, uh, Buddhism or Hinduism or Mayan tradition, if you read these books, Bhagavad Gita, or the Popo Vu or the Mai, or the Dhammapada, the Buddhist, or, or the Husia of Egypt, or the Odu'ifa of uh, the Yoruba, uh, you will see their particular risk on one level but they're universal on the other. Mm -hmm. So what you were responding to is a universal. But guess what? You also can like the particular mm -hmm. because it's a particular way of saying this. Now, like this concept that I said about Saru's time, to heal and repair the world. On one hand, that's particular, but it's also universal, you know, because other cultures believe we need to repair the world. And if you get into it, I've just developed as an intellectual project as well as a cultural project, but people take it as normal in their religious and ethical tradition. And I think Native Americans, certainly, I would say, do the same thing. Mm -hmm. right. so. It even shows up in astrology. With Is that Chiron. right? All He's right. a wounded healer. Right. Yeah. <laughs> thank you so That's much for Thank that. you. So anybody else have some terrific responses and questions? Let's have a lively dialogue. John. <clears throat> I arrived late. If you've already answered this, you don't need to do so again. I'd be glad to. Oh, all right. <laughs> uh, no, I, so far as I understand it, this is a movement that has simply taken on a life of its own and uh, spread from one person to another. Uh, I'm, I'm curious how far this can go without any kind of organization, or is there some organization that is promoting it? Now, when you said the movement, may I ask you what that is you're talking about? The Kwanzaa movement. Oh, oh, that's a holiday. Okay. 
Yeah, appreciate what you said about Kwanzaa. We, we don't really have a Kwanzaa movement. What we have is an idea that African people have embraced all over the world, on every continent in the world, throughout the world African community. And they use it in various ways. They use it uh, as a basic value orientation for their personal lives to teach their children, uh, as a philosophical foundation for their culture and social and political work. And even religious orders use their seven principle out of Kwanzaa. Uh, it's thousands of groups that use the seven principles as their basic value orientation. They also use it to name their children, okay? I mean, people are naming yeah. Mani and Emoja, you know, like that, Mia. I mean, this is, so it, as they have taken it, it's really truly a people's holiday because no matter how well I thought I structured it, if they had not embraced it and made it their own, and practice it and defended it uh, and uh, saw value in it, then it would have disappeared. One of the things I wanted to do, and my organization is called US, US means US African people. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to do, and I, uh, my organization supported me, is I wanted to make sure, one, that we don't try to get it approved. So we did not go and ask the city council or the state government or the US government to declare a holiday. We declared it as a matter of self-determination. We, we, we stayed away you know, from work. It's just like we did when, when I first uh, declared Malcolm X's birthday at Kuzaliwa in the 60s. You know, the students just came out of school. I mean, we just declared it, you know? So, but Kwanzaa has stayed. Uh, because it speaks to um, the best of what it means to be African and human. Because people find in those values uh, not just uh, a social philosophy that I just gave you, but also a personal philosophy. For example, I was talking to you about uh, the, um, let's say, Umoja. You know, they, it, it's clearly, each of them has a description uh, to strive for unity in the family, community, nation, and race. And one of the things that they think about, the first thing is, how do I relate to my mother and father, to my sister and brother, to my friends? Do I speak truth? Do I do justice to them? You see, so they're concerned with relational. You know, and African, African um, philosophy is always relational. And Kawaita is, uh, you know, an African philosophy uh, that is rooted in both classical culture as well as modern culture. I try to do a synthesis. I go to the past to recover, not to escape, you know? I go there to get the richness in the same way that the established order does. I mean, when it borrows from Greece and Rome. I mean, nobody asks, sometimes people ask, why you go to Egypt? Well, where should I go, Sweden? So it just <laughs> seems to me that I should go to Africa. I should go back. What we should say in the six, back to black. You know, to find things that speak to the best of what it means to be African and human in the fullest sense. So this, sir, just to uh, wind up, this um, holiday um, is linked to a movement. It's linked to the black freedom movement, mm -hmm. especially the black power aspect of that. So it has emphasis on cultural grounding, self-determination, struggle, social justice, racial justice, all the conversation that we had are brought into this conversation. And uh, some of the ones we only talked about like in small ways, like for example, environmentalism, now becomes a fundamental big part of it. You know, That shows the evolution of it. That shows the process that is created by the constant practice of it. And always, as I say in, in, in Kawaita, an ongoing synthesis of the best of African thought and practice in constant exchange with the world. Um, I may have missed it, but I'm wondering if there's one symbol or logo that's being used for Kwanzaa that's recognizable. Yes. So many other things like the Olympics has their mm -hmm. symbols. The Kanada, the candle holder, mm -hmm. the Kanada with the seven candles. And, oh, that's right. And, okay. uh, yeah, and usually, and one of the things that's very important Usually it's an African symbol. It's either the uh, Ashanti throne that, that goes like this and then like that, 
or it could be the pyramid, okay? I have a lot. When I travel, people just give me things that they've made up. I remember when we first started, one of our candle holders we made was a piece of driftwood. And we just put things in and made it. But the standard, more and more, we started having things that were similar than the Ashanti throne, I think, is the most popular. But one of the things that sometimes people do, and I think that they should not do that, is that they borrow the Jewish menorah because... Leave <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> one candle out? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because they have seven, I think. But it's, it's like, it's the tree branch. So if you see a U, whether it's a round U like that or a square like that, I always tell people, that's the menorah. Don't mix the two traditions. It doesn't help either one of us. I mean, you know, so go on and show the self-determination, the second principle, and you can develop any other kind. But sometimes people are lazy, and so they might just do that because it's available, you know? And then they started to do it. And then some people do it because, well, I'm, I'm gonna keep it like, they do it for different reasons, okay? <laughs> I think. Yes. You spoke, uh, you said that you Africanize yourself and you borrow African values. Re-Africanize. Yeah, re-Africanize yourself, okay. Um, Africa, since the contact with the Europeans and now the Americans, uh -huh. and all the other, it's falling apart, it has been falling apart for decades. Do you think Africa ought to cut itself from all the European Americans and everybody else and return back to its own traditions? Well, my, my, my evaluation of Africa is not that dire. It's just falling apart. I mean, America's falling apart. <laughs> but we, 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 we have to stay away from pathological understanding of human beings. I mean, I don't care how serious things are, there's always hope and there's always some people holding back the flood, raising up that which is good and beautiful doing millions of things, creating miracles for which there's no name. So I, I don't want to talk about our people like that. I, I, don't, I don't even engage in that. Now, one of the most important things, so when, when, I, when, I, when I say we Africanize myself, doesn't mean I'm not African. It's coming into consciousness of myself. It's almost like Ra in the Martin creation narrative. Ra is in himself, but not for himself, not conscious of himself. And he's certainly not created because he hasn't created anything. He is a, a Devin. This Devin is an infinitesimal small seed of possibility in an ocean of himself. I don't want to get too ontological now. But oh, he's there. He's there. And he comes into consciousness. And he develops himself. He said, I broaden out into the world and created the world. But the world he's broadening out in is him. And he's beginning to separate himself and contain the world that is there. The world is in him, but he is over that. And yet, you know, he invests all of himself in everything that he does. Now, how did I get to that, you know? It's something he said that made me think of that. And what it was was possibility. That human nature and existence itself is possibility. I teach a class in ancient Egyptian ethics, and people a lot of times ask me, where did evil come from? And so a lot of the Egyptologists, if they read them, they'll say it came with humans because that's the Abrahamic narrative. That's not so. Evil is in the structure of being because being is possibility. And so ontologically speaking, there's a necessity for both what, what is called, um, uh, it's called tenemu in ancient Egyptian uh, uh, ontology. And, and that's like unordered, unstructured. Um, I don't want to use chaos because I don't want to get it mixed up with the Greek, but that's the closest thing to it, okay? But because it so it's becomes an ethical word, and so it's not chaos. It's like going astray, being, it's called unbounded. That's it, unboundedness. It's unboundedness. 
And in order to be created, you got to put bounds on things so that they come into existence. So what happens here is that Africa is suffering massive oppression. And the question, sir, is how do they respond to that? Mm -hmm. There is no remedy except resistance, no strategy worth its name except struggle. And they have to struggle on every level. As Paul, Paul Robinson said to the intellectual, the battlefront is everywhere. There is no sheltered rear. And they have to struggle on a personal level, and they have to struggle on a collective level. And that is not easy because the dominant society defines reality and then backs it up with violence you can't even imagine every day. You can't imagine the rest of the world, how much violence it undergoes as a result of the US and its allies. You know, it's, it's when Martin Luther King said that in uh, uh, the Riverside speech uh, on the Vietnam War, you know, he, did you realize that he couldn't even imagine the kind of power this government has now and has amassed to invade the human spirit even. So it just seems to me that we shouldn't blame history on Africa. We have to ask, how do we help Africa to come into its own? And what are the things that it needs? And I believe, as a culture national, I'm a culture nationalist, and I'll tell you what that is in a minute. Because people, you know, they do theoretical clumsiness by saying revolutionary nationalists and culture nationalists. I want to get back to it. That, there's no such thing as different between cultural nationalism and revolutionary nationalism because it's two different kind of things. The reality is I think that the African must first, everywhere, not just on the continent, everywhere, wage a relentless cultural revolution. Mm -hmm. They must break from the consumerist, self-hate indicting kind of conversation and view of the world that Europe has given them. One of the greatest problems of our time, people, is the progressive Europeanization of human consciousness and human culture. Yeah, yeah. So that even people, you, you would think this is just Africa. Look at the Japanese cutting their eyes, yellowing their hair, you know what I mean? Yeah. Altering their face so they can look European. And when I say Europeanization, most people say the Westernization. But let's be honest. See, I mean, it's not Westernization. The most Western people are Hawaiians. You know we're not talking about them. We're in the West. We're not talking about Dwight. You know what I'm saying? You say people Westernized. We're not talking about y'all, right? We're talking about white people. We talk, so why don't we say European? So the battle we said in the 60s, and I repeat it, the battle we're fighting first, sir, is a battle to win the hearts and minds of our people. If we lose that battle, we can't hope to win any other. Now, I told you I was going to say to you what I said about culture. That I said, I said we're cultural nations. That means I believe Africans are a cultural nation, striving to come into political existence so that they're able to define it thin and develop their interests in a relatively uh, uh, effective and ongoing way. Okay can't be absolute sovereignty. There's no absolute sovereignty anywhere. So, but enough so that we can control our destiny and daily lives. You know what I mean? OK. <clears throat> and so what is cultural nationalism? It's, it is thought and practice informed by three fundamental principles. One, that the defining feature of a people is its culture. Second, that for people to be itself, and free itself, it must be self-determining and rooted, it must be self-determining and rooted in its own culture. Mm -hmm. And third, that the quality of a people's life and the success of its liberation struggle depends upon it waging cultural revolution within and political revolution without resulting in a radical transformation of itself, society, and the world. That's it. Okay? That's, that's what I mean. So they need to uh, embrace those fundamental principles. To see that 
the defining feature of any nation is its culture. And if you're talking about chaos in the country, you're talking about a culture that is not life-sustaining, a culture that teaches hatred, a culture that teaches vulgar and degraded forms of individualism, you know, a culture that teaches consumerism, a culture that as, as, as Dr. Mattia was saying about the environment, she had to stop the people because one of the things that Europe did was when it came over, it had no respect for the, the ecology. So they cut down the trees. They continued, why well, she had to plant 30 million trees? They cut down the tree. And the people, because they needed money and because there's no lesson and they moved away from the ancestors. She, in her book, she does a beautiful conversation about what the tree meant to us in the early day. People did everything around the tree. They had ceremonies, they had council meetings, they saw the tree as life, they saw the tree in relationship to the earth. I mean, she has a whole conversation about it, a whole narrative about it. But as the European came and they began to like call the people pagan, one of the things that you got to deal with, with um, I don't know if I, well, I'll say this, but I think y'all open it up. One of the things that, <laughs> one of the things, and Jan Haasman, uh, uh, he wrote the uh, preface to my, forward to my uh, uh, book, my, The Moral Idea. Uh, my dissertation was public. And he, um, he wrote a book called The uh, Price of Monotheism. And in it, he was talking about the kind of violence that came out of people needing to discredit everybody and to define themselves not just by what they did, but who they wasn't like and who was wrong. Mm -hmm. That's a rough thing. I mean, I'm walking down the Nile or the Niger, here comes somebody problematizing me. You're a pagan. You're a kafir. You're a heathen. What is that? <laughs> Won't you sit down? Let's talk. <laughs> what is all that about, comrade? I mean, you're going to problematize me from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet. My hair is wrong, my nose is wrong, my lips are wrong. I got a strange knee that lets me run fast, but I don't know what else. And my feet, they got a problem. So what kind of man would come and talk that kind of talk? Only way they could get away with it was force and violence. So when Europe prides itself and talk about how it won our mind, a lot of that was coercive. Mm -hmm. It's coercive, mm -hmm. you know? It's starving people and feeding them in kitchens and making them pray before they eat. You know, it's, it's just, that's just a model I'm giving you. Imagine that on a continental style. So I just think that we really, if we're serious about this, We've got to deal with the cultural problem. There's a cultural problem here. You know, I'm telling you, it's a cultural problem. And unless we deal with that, we'll never be able to do a, a, a struggle. One of the things I fear about, um, and it's not just this generation. I'm not one of those people talking about how the youth is failing and all that. I think it's the parents too. The parents <laughs> got some serious problems. But the people of this time, they seem tired. And you know, I expect the older, older people to be tired. But the young people come to school tired. A lot of them are hungry. A lot of them have family problems. Not just black people or Latino. You talk about white people. We teach white people too, y'all. That's right. You know, so I'm, I'm saying they come with serious issues. And you have to listen to them. You can't just come in and, I, I grew up, you, my mother and father sent me to school with a certain attitude, so I'm, a, I'm into a discipline, you know? I, do, I get up every morning before five, I sit on the floor, I read my text in my own language, I center myself. The, the rest of the people, they come late, so I know they went up, you understand? And they never think about structuring their life. They ask you about, when they're talking about the uh, class, is that going to be on the test? <laughs> if it's not on the test, why are we talking about it? <laughs> this is all the groups. It's not just one group. This is all the group. But guess what? This is America, a consumerist mind that has reduced us to playing with technological toys, that has cut down our attention span, that has destroyed our capacity to spell full, full words. You know what I mean? <laughs> One of the greatest 
and most uh, advancing classes now in colleges is composition. Teach people how to write in college. So I'm, this is American issue, right? I just want you to see that. So it's in that light. I hope I did some of your question, <laughs> but it's related to so much, sir. <laughs> so if I would sum up, yes. What they need to do is break from your culturally. Because unless they wage that cultural revolution, unless they begin to think a new way about the world and about themselves and reach back and recover the richness of their own culture so that it's theirs. No, they're not junior brothers and junior sisters, but they see the beauty in their own culture, speak their own special culture truth, and make their own unique contribution to reconceiving and reconstructing the world they live in. I think we need to um, move on so we can have a we break. We actually have a, and... a little uh, change of schedule. So <laughs> it's the canoe time? The canoe time, yeah. Yes. So the canoe has arrived. Um, actually, this is yeah. Ignacio on the post. OK, can I say something while you're doing that? Yeah. Refusal and resistance by all means, but yes, I love that you are bringing to the table it's also time for synthesis. And, yes. and that's the creative nice. force that allows us to move beyond that resistance. Yes. So thank that's you right. very much for that. No, we don't move beyond the resistance. It's Remember always going to keep I, going. We, all, we always <laughs> have to great. synthesize what we do. Yeah. We have to bring in the best. And there is no substitute. That no one said that. We can talk about the world as much as we want. But at one point, we must engage it. And that means on the ground resistance. Yes. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you.